Hi everyone, before we go into the podcast, I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I'm super grateful for your continued loyalty and support. If you could do me a quick favour, if you could give me a review on Apple Podcasts, it really helps the algorithm and it will help this podcast go up the lists. If there are any subjects or topics that you want me to cover, uh, then please do reach out to me on uh, DM on LinkedIn and I will do my best to find the best guest guest for that subject or topic. This is the Absolute Business Mindset Podcast, created and hosted by Mark Hayward. This podcast will interview entrepreneurs, business owners and careerists. We will delve into their journey to success, key life milestones and go deep into their expertise. Get ready to learn from other successes and failures. Today we have Maceo Jordan who it's a second interview. It's another second interview for everyone. Uh, so thank you, Maceo. Thank you for joining. I'm excited to be here, Mark. I'm glad you invited me back. Thank, thank you. you. And, and as we said just before we came on, uh, this is a little bit more free format. And we'll sort of just see where the conversation goes. This is a bit of the fun of doing these things. But we'll <laughs> start We'll start on sort of grounding. Where are you now with your healthcare business? Because I know you were putting a lot of time into it. I spoke to Marty as well. Marty was on my podcast a little while ago as well. So just tell me how that's going. Yeah, so we've made some significant advances. Um, at work. In fact, we're, we're starting some fundraising for uh, a pretty substantial digital offering. And so what, what came out of COVID from a clinical standpoint was obviously, how do you do healthcare if you can't or won't be in person. Mm -hmm. Um, um, So one of our our co-founders is still very active in the clinic and physical therapy. Uh, So we we built from the ground up uh, a digital solution uh, as well as the the treatment algorithm. So that that was a massive undertaking. And what what always shocks me is how much you can accomplish when you're like legitimately under pressure. Uh, And COVID was was pressure. So uh, Malton is his name. He's in Tennessee yep. and Tennessee, like a lot of States for hands-on uh, therapy, they said, okay, you can't do that uh, for probably four months. And it was like, okay, we either figure out how to do it digitally or we're going to be on the bread line. You know what I mean? We're going to be getting unemployment. Uh, so that motivates a lot of people. Yeah. It, we had a ton of help. Uh, the clinical staff was just beautiful and available and made all kinds of sacrifices to get it done. Um, so and how, to, how did you, how did you, so phys, if there wasn't physical therapy able to be, how did you digitally do it? Did the person who was the old yeah. do it to themselves or? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, you know, they're, they're rubbing their own back. <laughs> Could you imagine? Well, but that, there was some of that. Um, and honestly, that, that answers one, a, a broader question in entrepreneurship which is, do you, you know, do you have secret sauce or do you have ketchup? And that's a phrase I'm totally stealing from a friend of mine named Oren Claff, who had it said to him by a venture capitalist. He said, oh, that's not secret sauce, that's ketchup. So I, I use that mercilessly now. And we, we pulled it off, right? You've got to figure out how do you avoid, you know, having a 98-year-old you know, grandma trying to <laughs> rub her own over a neck or something like that. Yes, you've got to get a good clinical effect. Um, You know, you certainly don't want to be billing for, uh, you know, a medical procedure and then the person has problems, you know, just uh, medically and and, and morally, that's a bad thing. But also Medicare is starting to to say, well, hey, if you don't get a good outcome, then you don't get any money. Um, We just, we managed to pull it off. And it was because Malton is, He's a savant. I really don't know how else to describe it. I think some of it is because he doesn't see so well. Um, and so he's forced to listen. And then he's really got to be in tune when he lays hands on somebody. And he's just a, a master of physiology, you know, how muscles interact in general, right? So if you have a model of something, but then how your body acts, like I broke my femur when I was really, really little which changed my pelvic girdle, you know, it kind of tilts, yeah. my spine gets all twisty. Uh, you know, so if somebody doesn't know any better, they're going to, uh, like if I go to a chiropractor or a physical therapist, they're going to try and manipulate my body in the wrong way because they're going to assume it's out of whack for another reason. And so Melton, you know, he's been doing it for 30 years. 
Um, and he's just a savant. The guy knows, he knows the body. He knows how to get a result. Uh, you know, the staff was just brilliant at doing what's called an algorithm or putting, you know, in the right process of questions, feedback loops. Uh, yeah. So it was just a, a brilliant mesh of people and necessity. <laughs> and how did you get the tech? Cause, cause, I've worked with uh, a couple of people on my coaching and they've been in the tech arena. Someone set a website, someone's setting up an app. Yep. It it takes quite a lot of dedication. It takes quite a lot of time. It takes quite a lot of expertise to be able to do these things. How did you do it so fast? Who did you pull in to sort of, who, who's, who, who did you call in for favors? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say something that will drive my fellow programmers nuts. Um, you just, you don't need all that. Here's why. Because the end user doesn't care. They don't care about all the fancy stuff. They don't care whether you're using JavaScript or Ajax or, you know, you've got Tailwind. They they could care less. They don't care about workflows. What they want is the results. And they want to know when they go to either an app or a web page that they get what they want. Um, so the primitiveness of what we do, I think is really the secret to why it was successful. So for example, it starts out with a series of images, uh, where it's an illustration of a human body with a particular set of muscles, uh, colored brightly and over the top of it just says, you know, tap where you have pain. And so there's an image and not that, right. Everybody knows what not that means. So they click not that the next image and they just keep tapping either not that or then finally, Oh, that's where I hurt. From there, we go to another set of videos where mountain describes what's going on in their body. And then another set of videos where uh, we refine what they're going through. And so mountains actually with a human model and he goes into the, the activity that causes the pain. Uh, you know, so you don't need any fancy technology for that. I mean, this is literally just hand coded HTML for crying out loud. And you really don't need much more than that. Granted it, people feel better when things look good. And if, if a VC dumps like 10, hopefully when VCs dump $10 million on this, they're going to be like, okay, I'm sale. Let's make the UI look a little bit better, (laughs) but we have to understand like, that's just to make us feel good. Like the, the clients don't care about that. And so that's that, if anything, is the secret to bootstrapping any technology is strip away all the cool stuff that you learned or maybe you did at Instagram or whatever you've been doing and just focus on the result that somebody wants. Obviously, if it's pain, that's pretty obvious. It's like, okay, when I bend over, you know, I get the shooting pain here. Or like for me, I've got a, although my shoulder is better, it's like if I lift my arm and then extend it, I usually have a lot of pain, right? So the therapist would then know how to diagnose based on the movement pattern and then give the person a subset of things that they can do at home. So it's not, it's not ideal. Like you're not going to get, like if you've been in a car accident, you're not going to get full range of motion uh, at home. It's just impossible. You really do need someone to help you through some of that, but you're not going to be like on the floor because your back hurts so badly. We'll get somebody up and walking around and, and living their life where, you know, okay, I'm still a little bit stiff, but not, you know, Hey, I need like six grams of codeine just to get out of bed. So, so if, if people were doing this at home would because uh, in the UK, when we were going through COVID, uh, we had a we had a real problem with um, care like care homes and and, mm-hmm. and and that was a massive problem for the UK because we yeah. didn't get the people that were there were well they weren't were never protected because uh, we didn't right. have a vaccine but they they stayed and and but the families would never be able to visit. This was what they mm-hmm. used to see like heartbreaking scenes of right. of mother and father looking at each other through a, through a window, right through and, a window. But there were core staff that that sort of stayed and on the front line. Are, are you talking about people that are in that situation, or are you talking about people that are older but are still living at home and have sort of usually a sort of um, ability to be able to get around? Yeah, usually, for us, it's usually at home. Um, and so our, our clinical operations are, are not uh, what's called in-facility. That's, that's a different 
sometimes a different legal structure, uh, but definitely a different arrangement with the, the patient and their provider. Right. So most of what we do in, in the States is called out of pocket, right? So you're paying cash to somebody to, to get the thing done uh, versus insurance. So if somebody was in a care home, that's the physical therapy is usually going to be covered. Uh, you know, but even then it gets tricky because you were obviously talking about the government, which means there's a law and laws by their nature have to be very strictly written, which is why healthcare is such a difficult thing to do inside of the government, right? So going all the way down to like, what can the physical therapist actually do either on the person or with the person that's dictated by all the stuff that I mentioned, which is part of the reason why we stay out of that. Um, but that, that is one reason why things did get difficult with COVID is you had a system where people were at least, you know, used to and understood where they could go and then they couldn't go. And then all of a sudden you had the dictates from on high. Of, well, wait a minute, you can't do any of that. Right. I mean, it, we could spend the next hour debating, especially based on new information, whether we could have, should have, would have. But the, the net effect was these were mostly people that, that were at home. Uh, but whether we could have had somebody like in a care home sitting there, you know, uh, with their phone or a tablet or something and, and doing the exercises on their own, that, that was the beauty of it is they did not need, uh, you know, a trained medical staff to help them with the, the exercises. Fantastic. Well, good luck with that. I think, it's, yeah. I, I, I think you should bring it to the UK because there's my grandfather lived to, he was 89 mm. and he retired at, 66 and he spent all of his life all of his uh, uh, elderly life at home we he wow. lived quite close to my my mother so it was all it was all quite safe for him and he progressively got like worse with age mm-hmm. but that would have been ideal for him he he didn't yeah. want to go to a home he right. absolutely didn't want to go to a home he always he didn't like people when he had to work with people he didn't <laughs> want to live oh my with gosh. Of old people <laughs> yeah right age. so um that, that's that I, I think it, it, like you should think about bringing it over to the uk because there's a <laughs> there is a, there's definitely a market there for those types of characters but let, let's move on so when i was looking through something that i didn't see from the first interview was that you speak german and spanish we'll be back after a quick break Hi, I'm Alex, the host of X Health Show. Meet the future of healthcare. Think X Men, that's X Health. Actual superheroes behind programming living cells to cure cancer once and for all. Tech that detects preterm delivery in seconds, brain computer interface, or apps that employ AI to match you, your disease, with the best treatment. X Health Show brings to you visionaries who push the boundaries of healthcare from Switzerland, the heart of Europe, and the most innovative country in the world. Let me introduce you to their startups. Head to X Health Show, meet the future of healthcare. Happy to greet you there. I do. So there's, there's a funny story behind that. Um, so the, the like raw truth answer is not very well. Um, but so I was in a seminar once and to make a point, because this was like a personal development seminar. The, the instructor said, who here can speak Chinese? And I raised my hand. And my wife turned to me and she said, you don't speak Chinese. And I said, of course I do. She said, and she looked at me like, because of course she didn't. I said, well, that means thank you. And she's like, well, that's, and then she had to stop and think for a second. She was, she was about to say, that's not speaking Chinese. And I just spoke Chinese. So part of why I I have that like in my, in my bio is because I, I can, like, I can muddle along as long as you know, you're not speaking too quickly right. uh, and with German, as long as you're not using too many technical words, because German technical words are like a mile long and have 57 consonants. And it's just difficult for an American brain to translate that quickly, but you know, so I can muddle along, but it's really my commentary on how we view potential, right? So people would, would automatically say, well, no, I don't speak Chinese if, if they're not fluent it's like, well, hey, let's let's scale things down a little bit and say, well, yeah, I do speak Chinese. I don't speak Chinese well, or I don't speak very many words, but let's open up some possibility. It's really, it was really more about that. It's when 
when you open your mind to possibility, especially as an entrepreneur, your performance goes up because you have fewer hinders, fewer blocks. Uh, you find yourself uh, stopped or you know in in action, like wondering, oh, what am I going to do, or getting into panic states less when you lower the standard for things like that, mm-hmm. right? So an example would be with kids. If you ask kids, hey, who here is an artist? Like everybody raises their hand. But if you look at their output, <laughs> you know, it's sort of a critical eye. Like, okay, that's really horrible. <laughs> uh, in fact, I've got some art. Um, I've got a whiteboard right next to me and my daughter's drawn some stuff. And I look at it, it's like, okay, there's actually some good stuff there, but most of it's like any four-year-old, but it's still art, yeah. And we lose that as we get older. So it's there for that, you know, both as a, re- a reminder for myself, but also so hopefully I can, you know, kind of espouse that to the world. Because I think the world would be a, a much better place if if people thought more of themselves and that they were more capable of, of more accomplishments and more things. Yeah. I was never particularly natural at languages, but I did I did Spanish for six years. I did German for one and just it just didn't work for it but the the interesting (laughs) story about this is so so when I met my wife um we started going on holidays we used to take trips around France now I had never done a day of French lessons but the the more you go and you're going maybe once a year maybe twice a year and and sort of being embedded in the 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 language and the culture Mm -hmm. for like two weeks after a couple of years of this, I'd walk into and, and, and get a baguette on, and get a coffee or we're at dinner and I would know roughly what the food was and be able to order. And my wife went to me one day. She was just like, like, you've never had a lesson in French. How the hell? And I'm like, I don't know. It's very similar <laughs> to Spanish. There is similarities between Spanish and Italian and French. Yeah. And just... When you're embedded, like, like I, was, I can't remember who I was talking to. I was talking to someone, oh, um, Angelo Ribo, who's a, who's an entrepreneur, and he's Spanish but ended up in the US and Mexico and various places. And he he speaks like five or six different languages because he wow. embedded himself in Sweden for like six months, mm. things like that. And I really believe with languages and and with things where you need to learn, and it's really. You, you can you can attach to English or French or Spanish, whatever mm-hmm. the language is, to, to what you already know. You can just immerse yourself. And it's a great way of learning a language or learning, say, uh, a, a computer language like JavaScript or, or C Sharp or something like that. If you immerse yourself in that in, and you're with people who are speaking it, right. you, you, then you get an advantage by that immerse, uh, being immersed. Yeah, in fact, there are... Um, I'm completely forgetting the guy's name. There are, there are some TED Talks around this. And I think the, the YouTube title is something like how to learn how to be fluent in any language in six months. And it, it's a lot of that, that you get immersed. Uh, but the, I think the ingenious part is in the early days, you need to learn from somebody that's like a grandmotherly type. Right. And he says, because you want somebody that's going to correct you like a child, not like an adult. Because right. when our kids are learning to talk, we go, that's not how you say that, you idiot. But when we're an adult, especially, you know, if you're in a culture that has that sort of thing, you know, some of the Asian cultures are, are harsher like that, um, although not with their kids, right? So as an adult, if you're trying to learn, you want to go to that grandmotherly type. So they are more nurturing and they're patient, like, no, not this way, or, you know, and they'll repeat it several times. Um, but going back to, you know, what I said about necessity, I don't know, I just, I think... I think something unlocks when, you know, down to our soul, we know that something needs to get done. Mm. Um, you know, so if, if you, you know, could imagine somebody throws a black bag over your head at night, you know, injects you, it's like a Hollywood movie. Somebody injects you with something, you wake up in a foreign country, you're probably going to pick up on stuff pretty quickly, yeah. right? Your, your brain is going to be activated in ways that wouldn't happen if you just, you know, took, went on a holiday and, and flew down there. Yeah. So I think you know, one way to accelerate things is, is uh, you know, necessity, but definitely being immersed in whatever you want to do is by far the best way to learn for sure. So why did you become an entrepreneur? Oh man, Mark, it's, it's how I made part, part of it is personality. Um, you know, so I, in, in America, we, we say things like I'm unemployable. You hear people say that. Yeah, we say it as well. 
Do you? Okay. So if we dig into why that is, you can actually get into personality traits or like the big, big five personality uh, aspects. I think I talked about this in our, our first interview. Is so because of my one aspect of my personality where I don't give people credit just because they're in a position or just because they have a title, right? So, you know, to cut to the quick for you, it's like, okay, you're the queen. So what? You know, I really do feel that. Well, that just, I just like totally pissed off everybody yeah. that's watching this from the UK. And I, that wasn't my intent. I really, I didn't, I didn't mean that. I, I'm, I'm like begging you. That's, it's a disability. Don't pick on the disabled guy. <laughs> but the, the expression of that is yeah. not so great if you're in a corporate environment, because most people, rightly or wrongly, do demand respect because of their position. So I'll give you an example. I was, I was brought into a company, consumer packaged goods company. They, they said they wanted to grow to, you know, 300 bazillion dollars and, and all of that. And um, at one point, one of the, the founders said, you know, Maceo, wouldn't, wouldn't you do, you know, this and that just because I asked? And I said, no, it's a stupid idea. Like you were, it's not going to work. It's going to cost us money. And it's going to waste valuable time. I said, no, I don't care if you suggested it. And she really couldn't process that. Like her entire makeup was reliant on that kind of as the trump card. Yeah. Right. So that, that gets into interpersonal relationships, right? So we all have trump cards. If you're if anybody who's married, like has their own deck of trump cards that you know you want to throw out in an argument. <clears throat> And so that, that trait in me definitely makes me, um, I guess, employable in, in certain environments. That's what, kind of why I gravitated to tech. Uh, Peter Thiel likes to kind of poke fun at the Silicon Valley types and say, you know, it's basically a, a safe haven for people with Asperger's syndrome. And so, you know, my personality doesn't rub somebody who's like that the wrong way. Whereas if I was, uh, you know, more in like a sort of a hardline New York firm or something like that, whereas you know, this lineage or, you know, with the royalty or in politics, I'm just not going to fit in. Uh, so that definitely did, I think, push me towards entrepreneurship when I was younger and, you know, didn't really know what, I, what I'm talking about now. Like this sort of expression of my personality did come very much later in life. Um, but then I'll, I'll tell you, like most entrepreneurs, I had that classic encounter at a job really early in life. I was maybe 15 or 16. My dad had got me a job with a friend of his um, and I was sweeping floors, right? Because what else is a 15 or 16 year old actually capable of doing? And I was sweeping floors thinking about how little money I was being paid to do the activity that I was doing. Boss comes in, he's like, why are you going so slow? And being 15, I told him, right? That, you know, no, no filter which was basically, I want more money. And he said, well, I'll tell you what people, cause I was making $10 an hour at the time. And he said, people who make $12 an hour sweep like this. And he was like going like a madman. It was crazy. And I, I was thinking, okay. And this was my thought at the time. I said, no, that's how the owner sweeps. <laughs> a $12 an hour person sweeps like marginally faster than I do. Are you like, it, it didn't, it didn't compute to me. Yeah. Um, now, of course, I, I didn't, I didn't know it like that way. That's me looking back on it. But at the time I genuinely had that, that experience. I did have the, the presence of mind to not say that part, <laughs> but I had that realization, which was, Oh, wait a minute. Like this guy is just the way I, I thought about it. this guy is trying to extort more work in the hopes that I would make more money. Yeah. Cause that was, that was abundantly clear to me at the time was he wasn't saying, Hey, I'll pay you 12 bucks an hour. And if you sweep this way, then you get to keep it. It was sweep that hard for some undetermined amount of time. And then maybe I'll consider giving you 12 bucks an hour, which didn't seem like a great deal to me. So in that moment, I was thinking, wow, I just need to run the place because I don't want to do that. <laughs> have you ever, so it, was a, it was a combination of, of things. Have like, you ever, like most. I want you to, to, to log on later or tomorrow. Uh, there's something called 16personalities.com. Oh, cool. And it got shared with me uh, a, a week or so ago. And, um, and it's really fascinating. So you answer 30 questions, sort of, sort of psychometric okay. sort of questions. Yep. And then um, it gives you um, 
uh, a sort of, you know, like in, in Myers Briggs, you get an A, B, C, D, you get, mm. you get a number, and it's all about um, extroverted, introverted, intuitive, yep. all that sort of stuff. And then it gives you a definition of what type of person uh, you are. Now, I know what I am, but oh, cool. I'm, I'm not going to say what, what group it is or um, who these people were, but I, I, this was all shared with me on a WhatsApp group. And okay. Um, and this this was last week. Oh, I might there's loads of email. Right, I'm, I'm not going to find it. Um, and when I started listening to what they were doing before I was I did mine, there was all these sort of conciliatory, sort of supportive people, sort of like, um, sort of like almost like caregivers. Now they see no, it's in mm. this group. It's not. Yeah. It's not a. Uh, it's not like your street. As someone else told me we've got a street WhatsApp where we live and there's all stuff going. Anyway, so by the way, anyway, so I, I was looking through all these and there's like introverted people mm-hmm. and sort of um, um, sort of like in, uh, like uh, intuitive and all these sort of people. And I, and I did mine and I was what they described. And I don't know what the other ones are. I was trying to have a quick look, but I can't find it. Now, I'm a commander. Now, people who are commanders are people like Steve Jobs, Gordon Ramsay, and people like that. And and I tell the story not because I was talking to someone today and they were like, oh, well, you're just showing off because you're an extrovert <laughs> commander. I'm like, well, no. Well, yeah, oh, but no. And I said, look, the, the difference I think for me personally on how I – so I might have extroverted qualities – but the thing is, I'm I'm quite humble with it. I know I can learn from other people. I'm not arrogant per se. I I value people who have been there and done it, and and they know a hell of a lot more than what I know. And I can I'm 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 open to learning from other people, from books, from podcasts, and 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 build up my knowledge. And and it's not a it, like there's no end to the journey. Your your journey just mm-hmm. keeps on going. So I was I was talking about this, and 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 it was really interesting because all these people were sort of like. And, and and when I contrasted it with mine, I was like, geez, I hope this works. Because there's a couple of people I might do business with and things like this. I'm like, geez, I hope I don't like come over too extroverted or too over mm. the top. And because it's, it's, it's one of those that in, uh, introverted people can be in, incredibly productive and incredibly inventive and creative. Mm-hmm. But sometimes they meet someone who uh, whatever alpha male is but sort of towards the right. uh, extroverted version and they can be put off quite a lot because they'll they'll gravitate to what they know and, and people that they know and they yep. can be intimidated and 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 i i don't want that so when we have our first face-to-face when we get get this group together face-to-face it's going to be an interesting experience for me because are, are people going to be put off or because uh, sometimes right. Sometimes you also get the complete flip opposite and introverted people see someone who's able to talk and quite free on talking and they gravitate towards them. I find Mm -hmm. that sometimes as well. There's sort of people go, oh, okay, he's talking loud. I'll go and stand with him. Like at networking events and things like that. And and this is why when I go to network, my deliberate plan at networking is to say as little as possible. Mm. they'll get to if if they want to share what they're doing because it's all about co- connections and making connections so yeah right so my point is it's going to be interesting because there are extroverted people there are introverted people but how how do you think as a because you're quite a from my perception you're quite a strong confident person you know what you know and you talk very knowledgeably about it and you share that with everyone um even to the point of after the podcast we had a 30 minute chat about my business and you you freed up that time for me which was incredibly invaluable and i i still go back to that video every so often oh good refreshments of things but how do you find that as a long-winded question of how do you find when you're interacting in situations where you might not necessarily know the people very well, do you play it as a, an extrovert or do you play it a little bit, pull it back a little bit until the people are comfortable? <laughs> well, at, at the risk of coming across like a, like Machiavelli or something, um, it's very, I, I approach it very strategically. Um, so I'll always think about what outcome I want. So if my outcome is connections uh, for some future thing, 
then like you, I'll ask more questions. I'll get people talking, you know, more in the Dale Carnegie line. Mm. Uh, you know, people remember, people think more highly of you when, when you give them an opportunity to talk about themselves, mm. but it also gives me a chance to get to know them. Mm. Um, so one of the things that I learned early on, cause I, I was, I was a rabid networker younger, cause obviously we didn't have the internet or any other way to kind of, to group up, you had to go in person um, and so I got a lot of coaching around just how to network and, and the right ways to, to get results out of it. And the, the coaching that I got really early on was that I needed to take the, the ownership of the, the communication because most people, they just don't, you know, they go to a networking event, they collect a lot of business cards. And then six months later, like, Oh yeah, I've got this pile of business cards from, you know, either one networking event or a bunch. Yeah. So it was more getting to know what somebody did in as intimate a way as we could manage in, in that setting so that I could understand if that second, third and following uh, conversation was actually needed, or, you know, maybe we connected personally. And then if I wanted to expand my personal circle, you know, then I could, I could let them in. But, you know, underneath that is that when I studied the successful people of the world, because you know, so that could be uh, at the, you know, industrial age, so an Andrew Carnegie, a yeah. John Rockefeller, or somebody like that. No. These were to a person, very, what we would call now intentional people. Mm. They just didn't go through life willy nilly. And I think, especially today with just the mass of personal development information that's available, mm. I get the impression that that's really how a lot of people think. Now, ironically enough, as a younger man, I was uh, a Taoist, right? So a Taoist is basically go with the flow. Right. Um, so it's like, I've obviously swung all the way over to the other, other end of the spectrum where you're know, very much more strategic and, and structured. And I found though, that it was really difficult to get consistent results as a Taoist, right? It's just going through life and if an opportunity came up, hey, it came up. Um, so that, that I was... I don't want to say I was in, intentional about becoming intentional. It was more that I wasn't having success. And I realized that part of it was due to my worldview. And so I just modified my worldview uh, to get more successful. Mm. And so again, the basis of it though, is in, in looking for examples and understanding what of the example is actually usable and important. Uh, so I've made a study of, of just historical figures and, tried to get uh, both the positive reviews. So like a biography, a biographer who liked them, a biographer who didn't like them, uh, you know, reading as many exposés as possible and really sorting through, you know, what's fact and fiction, what's being exaggerated and not to, to get a picture of what really contributed to someone's success. You know, in, for example, modern times, you know, people have a, a picture of Steve Jobs you know, that he must have been this wonderful, warm-hearted person. That guy was a rat bastard, man. I mean, I screaming at people, you know, he threw a dude down the steps. Uh, he's throwing computers at people very much his way or the highway. Yeah. Um, but then when I, when I looked at Mother Teresa, when I looked at Gandhi, even in, you know, the non-corporate world, they were very much the same way. You know, if you were not on board with their mission, this baby, you're out. Now, maybe they wouldn't use the same language or throw somebody they, they probably wouldn't throw laptops at. <laughs> well right right but the the net effect yeah. though was very much the same right so i saw this universal nature of you know how to get things done which is my long-winded you know reply to um both your question and some of the underlying things like in that group and so I, it's not that introvert is not as good as extroverts. We, we want to make that value judgment naturally. It's more what's going to get the result. And the way humans are wired is that if you don't have, if you can't have a loud voice, you're going to be less effective as a leader. It, and I'm not saying that like in combat, I'm saying that just normally. So you have to be able to get some volume. Yeah. The reason why that's difficult uh, for most women is typically when they, when they increase the volume, the pitch also goes up. And so my, my advice for women would be to, to get some voice training so you can get a higher volume without getting too shrill because whether you're a man or a woman, it's like that shrillness, it's like, Oh, you know, it, it hurts your ears and um, you know, people can interpret it the wrong way. Yeah. 
So that's that loud, strong, what we would call in the military, a command voice is absolutely necessary. And then the other aspect of part of our human nature is your demeanor, right? So in the military, they call that your military bearing, um, right? So you've got your chest up, your shoulders back. You're not, you know, slouched over with your head forward like that. And I'm not saying that like, uh, I don't want to get into an evolutionary discussion. I just mean, what, what is going to elicit the, the response and the behavior that you need as a leader? And so having that posture is also going to be more effective. It's also going to communicate things to people. Yeah. And like I said, we can, we can, we want to make that a value judgment and it, it, it really just isn't, it's, it's just sort of, Hey, that's the way it is. Sorry. Um, and I, I say that as someone who had to learn all of this, right? So in the military, they had to, they send everybody to leadership training and not that I'm, you know, a huge military guy, but the military is very much by necessity outcome oriented because people will die if you start doing stuff wrong. And that's why it's instructive to at least look at their methodology. You know, I'm not talking about their morals and all that. Please let's chuck that out the window, but their methods are repeatable. So leadership training and then layers of leadership training, because you're what you need to lead a squad in the, in the U S military is the smallest unit. So that's maybe six to eight soldiers. That leadership is different than a platoon. So a platoon is usually four, maybe five squads. So you know, you're looking at 20, maybe 40 people, maybe 60 at the most, but leading 60, 20 to 60 people is a lot different than four or five and, you know, and so on as you go up. And so the military's methodology is as you increase in responsibility, you get additional leadership training because the, the needs are different. And how that relates to entrepreneurship is we all, we're all, I mean, you know, I've got a bookshelf behind me. It's like, okay, well, which one of those books do I as an entrepreneur go to when I'm looking to understand what does it really take to make an effective leader? Not what somebody's opinion is, because I picked on Simon Sinek. I'll pick on on our first interview. I'll pick on him again. You know, is it what Simon Sinek says or is it something else? And for most entrepreneurs, they really don't know. Uh, so that's where you're going and, and looking at some of these other resources to get a, a wider picture and a, a, I think a, a more in-depth methodology would help. So final piece on, like, so when you start adding in personalities to that, the unfortunate byproduct is people start getting put into boxes, right? You actually verbalize it. You know, you get put into the commander box. Yeah. It's like, oh, he's only doing that because he's a commander. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's like, well, yeah. And, you know, let's not leave it. Don't put a period. Can I at least get a semicolon? You know, can we at least have something follow that? Because when we put people in boxes, it goes back to, do you speak Chinese or not? You've now cut off all possibility for someone. And I, and I'm, I mean this at a very low level mentally, not, not low as in base or, or dumb, but low as in, it doesn't take a lot of thinking. So the way our brains are designed is to cut out decisions. I, I want to be able to filter out all the junk that's in my office while I'm talking to you. I also don't want to have to think about thinking about that. Yeah. Right. So when, when my peripheral vision picks up this, you know, this little Allen wrench or hex wrench, depending on where you are on my desk, I don't want to have to decide every time that that enters my peripheral, which is about when I look here, that, oh, ignore that. That doesn't need to be a conscious thing. So on a low level, I ignore it. That's the lowness of what I'm talking about. So if I put you in that commander box, what I've done is now inserted commander box at one of the lowest levels possible, which means the possibility of who you are, the bigness of who you are, the amount of contribution that you can possibly have is now all inside the four corners of commander, which may or not may not be a good thing. What I would advocate for in any group is to avoid that as much as possible, if only so that the group has more potential, right? Because I mean, you just have to start stacking up boxes to realize, well, multifaceted, you don't have to be just one thing. You can be one, one group. You can be one thing to your family. You can be to your friends. There are multiple layers. I think this is, this is, this is just a neat little way of, it's a bit of fun and it kind of is, it was a conversation starter. And, And for the purposes of, 
the group. I think it was a good way of just sort of teasing out a little bit about everyone that was on the WhatsApp group. So I actually think it it, it served its purpose. Um, hopefully no one's going to sort of like when we do a face to face and go, well, you're that and you're that. And you're that. <laughs> you go over there. I'm going over here to stay away from you, but we'll, we'll hopefully not do that. One thing that's been bugging me, you're talking about things in peripheral vision. I wrote this right at the start. How did you hurt your leg? What did you do to your femur? Oh man, that was, that was a horrific accident. Um, so our, our babysitter at the time decided to drink some alcohol along with, I think it was either asthma or allergy medication. And she passed out while we were driving. And, uh, you know, I mentioned our first interview, you know, I, I, at that time I, I had a photographic memory, um, another injury kind of wrecked that, but I, I still have a, a vivid memory of looking over at the car next to us and the, our cars got really close. And so my kid brain thought that they rammed us and we went off to this, off to the side. Mm. Um, but we hit this massive tree going full speed, um, you know, the, and the car, the car was going so fast that when I hit the front seat, cause this was long enough ago that there weren't seatbelts. Right. Um, so I hit the back seat and then the back of the car hit my leg. So it was actually the, the rear seat that broke, that broke my femur. Um, but then after the paramedics got there, um, I didn't look, uh, injured. And so the paramedic called me out and then I walked on it. And so the bone, it was a, it was a really nasty break. Yeah. But then the bone actually overlapped when I walked on it, right. got to the, well, the guy, the guy put me in uh, the front seat because they put the kids, ba- the babysitter's kid, my sister, uh, who ended up dying, she hit the, the car door so hard, her, her brain, she went into a vegetative state, her brain just wound up bouncing around in her head. But so there's three people in the back of the, of the ambulance and it was full. So I was on the lap of the paramedic when he closed the door, it hit my leg. And I passed out because it hurt so bad. It, it gets, so it gets a little bit worse. So I get to the hospital. They had me in a crib. One of the nurses lifts me out. And my leg was kind of bent back like this, just kind of naturally, not like deformed, because otherwise they would have known something was going on. But when she picked me up, obviously my leg dropped down. So I screamed again, passed out. Um, How old were you? I was three. Uh, actually, two and a half. So just coming up on three. Oh, so then I wake up on you know, the metal table and I look over and the doctor and my mom are looking at the x-rays. Well, so what all that trauma did was actually a good thing because it, it wound up separating the bone, right. which, which is what saved me from needing a bunch of pins. And the, the, the doctor explained that to my mom and she explained that to me much later. Um, but, you know, I was in traction for, geez, a month. I was in a body cast for about six months. Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty nasty. But as a kid... You know, I got over it really quickly. My mom had a friend of hers make like these little turtles so I could get around on. Uh, you know, to me, it was fun. Three-year-olds, anything could be fun. Yeah, true. true. <laughs> wow. But yeah, the net effect of all of that trauma to my leg is that my, they, they let, the reason why I was in traction is they wanted the bone to grow together. Yeah. Right. So what the doctor said is, well, let's see if his bone will actually grow together. Um, but it was a little bit further apart than what was natural. So my right leg is, is about a half an inch longer than my left uh you know so that means my hips actually <laughs> so t- it's tilt just, to- it's, it's like there, there's all this sort of so this sounds it's sounds funny my, my my grandfather was assured in his head that he had nine and a half size so what's that i don't know what that's in the u.s but nine and a half size on his left foot and he was 10 on his right <laughs> and and we were like that's just absurd he would go to he would go to to um shopping centers and buy shoes and he would and they'd bring out what do what what size do you want nine or ten he's like i want one nine and a half and one ten and people yeah. think he was like taking the piss he's like no 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 this is so right. how it is so he used to buy these and 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 what the funny story, the funny story was like uh, he, at the start, everyone sold him two pairs of shoes where well, you've got to take both. He was right. able to, to develop a, a sort of conversation with the person to say, well, you know what? You could just put them in like lost and found or something. You could, you could just lose the left one. And right. <laughs> That's and fantastic. He, had, he ended up going into these shops knowing that he would walk out with a nine and a half and a 10. Oh and my goodness. He, he was, he was, a, he was a, he was a great character, my grandfather. That's great. With us. Um, what would you say your top three priorities in your life 
personal or professional, whatever. Could be sport. It could be what anything. Top three priorities for you at the moment. Yeah. So the top one is always, you know, service to, to Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, so that's, that's my, my core worldview and, um, really everything flows from that. So having, making sure that I'm serving people, um, oftentimes not so well, but having that, you know, at the forefront of my mind, uh, and now, you know, now and I think we talked about this at the end of the last interview it really is legacy. I'm, I'm thinking about it very much more, that I did as a younger man, you know, so what's going to be left once I'm gone. And I think that's a result of, you know, my, both of my parents now are gone and I'm thinking about like, wow, you know, if it weren't for me, who would remember them? You know, it's not like we talk about them all the time or other people are calling, calling about them. I don't see them on TV. Um, but then also thinking through like, what does that mean? So um, making that legacy, something that's that lasts, but that's not about me you know, so not, not so ego centered. Um, and then the, the last one I would have to say would be health. You know, I could probably go on for another hour of uh, a lot of the health challenges, but I was almost dead a couple of years ago through, from kidney failure. Um, you know, so making sure that, um, uh, you know, I'm pursuing health so that the other two can actually happen. Those would be the, the top three for sure. It's interesting, the whole health thing. So I'm now 41 years old and for the first 39 years of my life I really just just sort of went do you know what I mean like just life right um well no that's a slight exaggeration so so uh, I I've had a couple of bereavements in the last three years I've lost my mm. brother my mother and my oh, grandma, wow. all in sort of this two and a half year period and and health wasn't a massive trigger for yeah. me it, wasn't, it was just but now knowing what's happened with them and sort of I, I'm sort of trying to prioritize health a lot more than, yep. than I usually would or have done in the in the past. And I, and I always think uh, those things those things that happen to you and and uh, they happen to lots of people. People have bereavement yep. sometimes even younger than me. Like someone I was listening to on Clubhouse lost their I can't remember if it was mother or father at eight years old, and oh, like, wow. I, like wow. that's just that's that's life defining. Absolutely. Uh, for me, the sort of situation I've been in, it's starting to be life defining. I, I left my corporate job. I'm doing this mm-hmm. now full time with other things, other jobs and things like this. But it's really interesting that you talk about health because I think there is a tipping point, an age. I'm not sure what that age is. I'm it's probably about 40, something like that, yep. where you're suddenly like, geez, I'm not as young as I used to. Invariably, you might have kids, you might not have kids, but you're like, it's so funny. My my daughter takes the mick out of me every time. If I'm if I'm like laying on the floor or something like that, and I go to get up, I now make that noise my dad made. Oh, yeah, and right. Up. And it's like <laughs> she like takes the mick out of me, and I remember doing it to my dad. I'm like, oh my god, I'm now at that part of my. Yep. <laughs> and it's like these things happen just constantly with with families, and it, it, it it's it's made me just think. Do you know what? I need to think about my health as a longer project to, to be mm-hmm. there. for me. It's, it's to be there for my children, to be there for my grandchildren and, and be significant in their life. So the legacy for me, yes, my businesses have to work to be able to supplement that, but having right. good health to then be able to have a long life and a full life is, is incredibly important. It's, it's growingly importantly too. Yep. You know what I mean? It's not something I'm like, right. I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to run a marathon or even the running the marathon might not be good for your joints, but do you know what I mean? Like, it's not like we're trying to do it how I do everything else, try and learn every day, pick up something new, learn something, develop mm-hmm. my, my skill set on health. Cause it wasn't a massive priority for me. So I think that's a really important one. And I think everyone listening here is probably over 40 is going, yeah, I make that noise as well when I stand up and, uh, and everyone does. Yeah. So, and for me, it was a similar thing. My my boys started commenting on the noises I was making. And of course, I didn't realize I was making them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's so part of it is, you know, I now listen to myself. Like if I get up and I want to make the noise, um, I take that as a, as a sign, like, am I not stretching or, you know, am I stretching too much? Am I going too hard at the weights? Do I need to go hard at the weights? You know, so I 
as, as most people could probably imagine by now, if you're listening to me, I tend to go to extremes for with things. Um, and when it, when it comes to the body, the reason why that that's just not a long-term strategy is we're limited beings. Like we don't have unlimited anything. Mm. Uh, and so whether or not, you know, you can make an equation out of it doesn't matter. I just know that there's going to be a cost, right? So if I want to go be Mr. CrossFit, uh, you know, that's going to, that's going to take a toll. If I want to go run a marathon, you know, it's going to take a toll. And I think it now, um, I'm thinking of it more in the, in a trade-off sense where before I wasn't, you know, it was really more just the, the outcome and wanting to be competitive and, you know, letting that, that part of my expression come out. Uh, it, but now realizing like, okay, yeah, you can still compete like that, but then what's the cost? Yeah. You know, are you going to be 70 and you're, have, you have to have a walker? Are you going to be in a wheelchair? You know, are you going to be like Ronnie Coleman with 15 back surgeries chewing, you know, four Percocet just to, you know, stay normal? Oh, what, you know, that, is that worth it? Yeah. So I, I'm at least able, I think now more to, to think about those long-term effects. Um, I think that's so true. I think, I think, as you say, it's an interesting one. I've never really thought about it. If, when you make that noise, you're doing something that's either a stressor mm-hmm. or like you've stressed that because of something else to do with the health, i.e. too much running, too much weight, too much, just, just too much right. of, of anything. So, yeah, I'll think about that. Um, do you have a pet? Do you have I, I don't know. No pets. Um, Funny, you know, we, we've talked about getting dogs. Usually when, when I think about a dog, it, two things come to mind. The poop and needing someone to babysit the dog when you leave. <laughs> so, you know, it's, I, that's, not, you know, that's not conducive to getting something. Is one of the first things you think about might be slightly negative. Uh, but no, I, I love dogs. I just don't – I've got to adjust my thinking if I'm going to actually have one around the house. So we've got a miniature schnauzer. Oh, I love mini schnauzers. Yeah, no. Schnauzers are great. So he's just coming up to eight. He's a, he's a seven, no, eight. He's a year older than my daughter. We, we, we tried out pets before we had kids. If the, <laughs> if the dog didn't die by neglect, exactly. you can probably have a kid. You'll be all right. So if the dog isn't hit by a car because you're not watching him, then you're pretty, probably pretty good. <laughs> but do you know what? He's a great companion. He's, he's great. Yeah, right. It's, um, Yes, you have to deal with the poop. Yes, you have to walk him every day. Um, and uh, but kids poop too, right? I mean, oh, you yeah, exactly. There's yeah. no get out of jail for a card. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! No, it's it's funny. You know, dogs especially are, I think, so gratifying because they're always they're always happy to see you. I mean, even like my neighbors, their dogs are happy to see me. You know what I mean? It's. I think that's why we like them so much. I grew up with cats, but my grandfather. I talk about my grandfather. Oh, me too. But he had dogs. So when we got into the place, me and my wife, where we were like thinking about to get a pet, I was all for, I was like, well, actually a dog might be really nice. And, and you know what? You're absolutely right. He's always pleased to see me. He, he, he always wants my, like, but we, we we talk, me and my wife talk about, it's like, he wants our attention, but Mm -hmm. in a positive way. He wants to sit with you. He wants to be with you. He literally, my dog anyway, loves being around the family and being in the middle of everything that's going on. But I'm not going to criticize my kids, but your kids, they want something from you. Yeah, they want right. to be, have guidance. They want food. They want to have a bar. Do you know what I mean? There's always something yeah, right. they want. They feels like they're taking something from you. I always feel with my dog, he he's sort of trying to give something to me. And that's, that's our relationship. And I, I've, I've talked to other people, especially people who have dogs just go, Oh yeah, absolutely. That like our dog is, is the best one of our children. So it's like, yeah, I've right. got three kids, including the dog. And I much prefer my dog to my kids. Yeah, right. Well, but so th- what I love, what I love about that, Mark is, uh, you know, so talking about whether it's entrepreneurship or just relationships in general, um, and this does, I'll, I'll kind of jump off where I stopped with the, the commander thing, mm. right? And so if we're not careful, we can, we can live our life at that low level mm. where we're not really making decisions about things. Um, you know, we've more set programs in place. So we don't, right? We don't have to think about it. Uh, there was a movie, um, I was with Adam Sandler and he had this remote where he could like stop time and put 
uh, captions on people so we could understand languages. But the, the overall theme of the movie was, you know, are you, are you living your life or are you just getting through stuff for another outcome? And I've got to tell you the the easiest way I found to short circuit things. So then I don't have to, you know, I don't have to think about it a lot or even, even worse, go, you know, go into therapy or, or courses or stuff for five years is to go into a relationship where it's my only objective is to give. Mm. And that might be giving somebody, you know, a helping hand, like if they drop something and picking it up, Mm. the way I'll, I'll remind myself is if I see something on the ground, that's trash, I pick it up and throw it away. And so that's a cue for me to get into that giving mindset. So give me an example. I was dropping my daughter off at daycare and one of the kids, a uh, little boy was just like screaming, hollering, crying. And I mean, some boys do that, but normally they just don't. I mean, that's just kind of how boys are. So I knew something was wrong. That's my point. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, so I watched the teachers for a minute and you know, they were instructing him and they were telling him to do things but I got the impression after about two or three minutes that nobody was inquiring into what was going on. Like nobody was giving to the child. They were all taking, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so I just went up to him. I'll call him Mike. I was like, yeah, Mike, what, what's wrong? And he, he said, I'm hungry. I was like, oh, do you want something to eat? Would you like some applesauce? Because I you know, take some extra stuff for my daughter so that she can give it. You know, I want to try. I want to give her the opportunity to, to try that and, and see the result. And so I said, oh, Savannah, you know, would you go get Mike's, you know, uh, applesauce? And so I also wanted to give to her, right? So I, here's the, here's kind of the deep thing that I got to. I got this from somebody else. I could have essentially taken that from my daughter by going and getting the applesauce. But I was able to then give to her the ability to give to somebody else. And so I found like when you, when you start to layer things like that, you wind up setting up this feedback loop where things just start to happen. It's really an amazing thing, especially if you're with, you're with people. I've actually experimented on this where I'll start with little things like helping people out. Someone's like, man, you know, I'm going to go get some water. Oh, Hey, I'll get that. I'm getting up anyway. Um, You know, just doing that. I, it spreads. It's the wildest thing to observe, especially if there's a little bit of affinity in the group. So I used to do this like in mastermind groups and, and whatnot, um, in fact, one, these were all very successful entrepreneurs. So it's like, how do you give to people who already have a lot? And so what I would invariably do, uh, would be to go sneak off and pay for the meal. And so that would usually be our first thing. So I would start the evening off with a gift. And I the the difference between an evening where I didn't do that or somebody else didn't do that. And when I did that or somebody else did, it was radically different with the group. Yeah. And so, you know, in, in talking about, you know, how, how as entrepreneurs do we actually, you know, make a difference in our employees, make a difference in our clients' lives. If you can set up those kinds of feedback loops where that is the thinking in the business, where people know that's what, what you do and who you are, not that you're saying it to them, but that you actually do it and you perform it, radical things start to happen. So I guess I'd have to add a fourth thing to the list. Um, you know, so people, people quote Gandhi as saying like, be the change. Um, and what I've found is that most people don't do that. Like they, they're, they're not being the change. And so that, when I started thinking about how, how can you actually do that and make an expression that works in the world, um, giving, you know, that, that gift of service and, and making that as a propagating effect I found is what enables one to be the change. You think about things very deeply. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you seriously do. Yeah. Uh, and, and and it sounds like you know, when you talked about earlier about the networking, I go with intention. I go mm-hmm. to serve people. I, I, I went to that child and, and I thought about, and you thought about what's wrong with the child rather than them just throwing a toy at him or whatever they were doing. Mm-hmm. And you then made that into your daughter being part of that serving and helping other people. Does your yep. brain ever switch off? <laughs> well, that's, uh, yeah, that's why I laughed at first. It's like, yeah, it's both a, it's a blessing and a curse. Mm-hmm. It does. Uh, I've, I've got some special medication that helps. <laughs> Actually some, I do, I do take some supplements to help mm-hmm. because there's a cost for that. Right. So you're, we've got peptides and all this stuff going on in our brain. If, if we're constantly active 
that's got a cost to it. Uh, so yeah, I do, I do definitely supplement for that. Um, you know, not that, and, and I don't, I'm not saying supplement like, I'm, you know, dosing heroin or something like that. These are like legitimate vitamins and minerals. Uh, in fact, one of them just got a nice arrangement with your doctor. All right, <laughs> right. I'll just pop over with the bag. It's fine. Yeah, all right, exactly. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, although you know, in in, you in a sense of full dis- what what because I I I never I've never really heard of a supplement apart from I, I heard someone on a podcast who lives in in California who was telling the the the, the podcast host about the the little gummy bears which now are laced with cannabis and that's he's got ADHD and from a very serious point of view he, he said mm-hmm. not because he moved to LA but he moved to California and these are a really good way of just taking the edge off of his ADHD yep, right. calming that down even if it's just for a night right a really good sleep and then starts not starts again, but you know, I mean, starts his normal day and his normal routine. Yep. Um, what what sort of supplements do you take? Yeah, so there's a, a product that's got a, a natural form of lithium that I use. It, it is, I mean, it is life changing for that kind of chatterbox always on. Um, but it's not like uh, the pharmaceutical lithium. And to get into the, the technical aspects of it, it has different valence electrons, right? So it, it doesn't interact with your body the same way the pharmaceutical does. And so the effect of it is far more, uh, I've, I've got far less what I call extra thoughts, right? So it, an extra thought to me would be where like, let's say I look at something on my desk and that reminds me of something, right? So the curse of having a memory like mine is I remember a lot. And, you know, as you would expect, especially highly charged emotional events, which unfortunately, you know, with my upbringing, we're not all positive. Um, so the, that supplement in specific blunts that effect where it, it really feels like more of a choice. It's like, okay, I'm still presented with the thought, but then I can decide to pursue it rather than, you know, just kind of, I imagine like the, someone with ADD would think that they have to go get it. Mm. Um, then there's another one called Minchex uh, from Standard Process. That's, I find really more, it, it lessens, and I'm still looking into the science of it, but it, when I'm taking that supplement, I really don't live as much in the past. Um, what people may not assume about me, but I very much ruminate on things. And if I'm not careful, um, you know, I'm going to ruminate on, because I'm competitive, past failures, what I did wrong, you know, my harshest critic, all of that is, is I think, almost endemic in entrepreneurs. Do you and I think partially... Negative talk. Like, oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, with, without question. Now, most of the time, I would take it in stride, right? So I would have the, the negative self-talk would kick in. And before I got into like a low, not necessarily, I've been depressed, but not, you know, it's not regular that I would get depressed, but just sort of that low, like, oh, you know, I'm kind of a screw up thinking like that. Um, I, would, I would turn it around, but I'd have to be intentional about that. And I, I learned that, um, you know, as, as a process for myself and just listening to my self-talk and, and going through some uh, personal development courses, you know, so I first had to understand that it is possible to observe your thinking without changing much of your thoughts. If you observe it for too long, you, you will change your thoughts, but I was able to, you know, observe, understand, okay, what's my brain trying to tell me, you know, is there some danger here? Is my, is my brain trying to lead me in the right direction? So then rather than get caught up in all the negativity, think, okay, what am I doing right now? What just happened? What am I thinking? How does that relate? Mm-hmm. And so I would pause, kind of relate all that together, and that would help to lift me out of it. But then another thing I realized is I'm very, I'm very much empathic. And what I had to realize, um, this fortunately was a while ago now, but I had to realize that some of what I was experiencing in life was going on with the person that I was with, mm-hmm. you know, that I was talking with. And so if I might have a flash of something from my past and think, wow, that was weird. You know, why am I thinking about, you know, my mom beating me just to get like really down in the, in the depths of it. Like, that's really weird. So what I learned was that that maybe was going on for the other person. Like that might be on their mind. So I tested it out. You know, I wouldn't ask them, well, Hey, did your mom beat you when you were a kid? Cause that would be like really, that'd be really rude and invasive, but I would, I would tease it out. And I did find that very often if I connected with somebody and I had what I would call like sort of extreme thoughts. It could be happy. It could be sad, but like really emotionally charged thoughts more often than not, 
it was what they were experiencing um, like by proxy. So my brain was feeding to me my version of what they would go through. There, you're absolutely right. There is a frequency. People have, uh, mm-hmm. this is what I believe. And I don't know, I, I, this is not based on anything apart from sort of my sort of intuition. I, I genuinely believe people have a frequency when they're talking and thinking. And not to go a bit woo-woo, but I'm probably going to go a bit woo-woo. But when you're with <laughs> positive people, or you are a positive person and you're sharing that with, with somebody, it, it, again, it can lift a group it can lift a conversation yep. and as you were saying about sort of paying the bill that that encouraged openness and encouraged yep. sort, of, uh, right. sort of giving and supporting everyone so it's a really interesting because I, I really do believe that when because i i've i've cut out certain people in my life just because mm-hmm. they would not be they were not being fruitful in my life and yep. people have called me that I'm still friends with and still know them are like you're you're quite harsh I wasn't harsh in the fact of uh, rude to them I was never rude to them it was yep. just when things came up and it was all of us I did, no, to be honest equally most of it was was consuming alcohol like a lot of alcohol and i kind of changed my view <laughs> on on alcohol as well but that, then, that can skew things a little bit more <laughs> the thing that's interesting about sort of when i was talking to some of these people and it, it, it was just it was it was a feeling or a sort of just when you when you started because i sort of analyzed when after the event i sort of my my sort of power is that i self-reflect quite quickly Mm. so on 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 an exchange with a conversation with a podcast or an exchange of conversation with someone i can i've been able to now develop a skill where i'm able to reflect whether that was in a broad sense positive negative happy sad whatever that was oh wow and it makes you think about what i why people are acting in the way they act Mm -hmm. and it was it, it was a it well, I don't want to go into that conversation about this. There's another story, but I think I think people are based on wavelengths, and people are some people are more in tune with other people's wavelengths than, than other people. I would not say I'm good at being greatly empathetic. My wife tells me I am not empathetic. I think I can I can be supportive and help people, and sort of sometimes give good insight into people. Mm-hmm. But that's because they're showing me. They're showing me with body language, with actions, yeah. with history of what's happened between us. It's not always an isolated incident. It's a built up over a period of time. Yeah. And I genuinely believe, and you were saying like uh, like uh, slowing your brain down, I think like that 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 sort of wavelength, it, it just slows your uh, the way you uh, share yourself, share with other people who you are. And I think it's a really interesting idea. Like I, I see, I, do you have trouble sleeping? Oh yeah. For, for a long time I've had, yeah. Tough time staying asleep. Uh, you know, it's kind of waking up throughout the night for sure. I, I, love, I can be pretty intense in my job, in my podcast, whatever I'm doing, but I get to my time to go to sleep and I value sleep probably more than most people. Oh, yeah. So I now, I know what time I need to go to bed if I'm going to have a good day. If it's an hour later, I'm probably going to have a poor day, at least. At mm-hmm. So I'm quite regimented about my sleep, but I'm quite lucky. I can put my head on my pillow and I can kind of most, most situations go to sleep. And but wow. my wife struggles with insomnia, and she struggles with with not sleeping. And I've got another friend who, who really struggles with it. And um, so, what my point was, someone said to me a little, a little while ago about how to create a, a a path to go into sleep. Right. Yep. And, and things like don't drink right till you go to sleep. Maybe take a supplement. Maybe drink a herbal tea. Um, get rid of blue light from your screens and maybe read instead and and maybe give yourself a period i also got my wife recently these um these blue light sun uh, glasses yeah i just got some of those myself from australia i think i'm not sure where we got it from 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 amazon (laughs) where everyone gets everything from right (laughs) (laughs) and uh, and she's trialing it and seeing if it, it, it it will help so so, so what my point is, do you have a, an, an evening, everyone talks about morning routine, do you have an evening routine on how you get ready for, for sleep? 
Yeah, I do. In fact, um, the the latest incarnation of that is the the uh, gla- the blue light glasses. Although funny, now that you're talking about it, the last I think two nights I haven't slept well and and I haven't worn the the glasses. I try and you know wear them. I think the the manufacturer said at least two hours, right. uh, you know, before you go to bed. Um, so anyway, so the blue light uh, that I also got the the a mask, which which did help. Um, but you know, it's, it's summertime in, in Arizona yep. and I'm, I'm kind of freaky cheap about some things. So sometimes I'll let the heat, I think get a little bit too high in the house. So some of it might just be, I'm like a sweat ball, right? So waking up in a pool of, of sweat is never fun. And it's usually when the air conditioner kicks on, right? So now it's this cold puddle of sweat. <laughs> so it's, it, I find a lot of times if if something is not going well, I'm usually doing something to contribute to it. Um, so it, yeah, so I do have a routine, although not normally. You know, I've I've been pretty cavalier. Um, you know, again because I'll I'll make some kind of compensation. I'll use modafinil, or you know, I'll take some kind of supplement not really thinking about the trade-off. It's like, okay, well, yeah, Maceo, you can do those things and you are going to get a, a certain amount of performance out of the day, but what does that mean down the road? And I, I never really thought about that because my genetic makeup or whatever enabled me to not have a lot of effects up until I think now where I'm starting to think, okay, that might not be such a great idea where, you know, yeah, it's a prescription, but I'm still using a pharmaceutical to make up for the fact that, you know, I had a fitful night's sleep that, you know, let's, it's more, let's deal with the, the underlying problem. Uh, so that, that routine is really pretty, pretty new. Okay. And but I do want to, before, before I forget, yeah. um, the, the frequency that you're describing actually isn't woo woo from the standpoint of, uh, you know, like fairies and pixie dust kind of woo woo. Right. Um, in the early forties, uh, the scientific community was very well aware that quite literally every cell in our body is transmitting a measurable radio frequency. Okay. Um, and in fact, right up until about the mid fifties, it there, that and a few other things were, were really common in the medical literature. Um, it was well talked about. And so, you know, when you, when you think about us being surrounded by electronics, like I've got two screens, which you can't really see on the camera, a computer, you know, I've got a cell phone, an iPad, my wireless device. I mean, there's all kinds of electromagnetic smog, if you will, um, that does, you know, have an impact on us. But then also when you talk about human interactions, we're, we're not quite sure what the range of that is. Mm. Um, I could get into some of the physics of it where we've got to realize that, Distance is not always relevant to to all forms of energy, mm. right? So if I have an AM radio, I've got to stick a grounding rod pretty deep in the ground. Mm. I can actually pick up that signal from 500 miles away if I have the right equipment, but I'm going to pick it up through the ground, not through the air. Mm. The military doesn't like it when you talk about that kind of stuff because it does get into you know some some classified communications right. but that is a principle that's well known even among ham radio operators and you know radio telegraph and teletype and that sort of thing so we don't know what the range is of our frequency uh technically speaking it could be from here me to you like arizona to the uk mm. um and and actually you know in real time but then we also have uh mirror neurons in our brain and so there's there's specific areas of our brain that are designed for us to pick up on other people. So facial expressions, tonality and things like that. So we've got a lot of this frequency that's going on. So that, so that language that we use is, is really describing um, the true nature of human relationship, which is kind of why this virtual is, a, is can be exhausting because in order, for, in order for me to pick up on that, I've got to be uh, you know a little bit better attuned because I don't have a 3D picture of you. And actually right now I'm looking at the camera, you know, now I'm looking at you. And so if, if I'm looking over here, I'm like picking up on, on my peripheral, right? So it, it, it can just tax the brain to, to try and do what it normally would do in person. Yeah. But anyway, that's, that's very much something that I think we should just talk about because it's, it's part of who we are. Both, you know, the kind of the weirder thing was like, wait a minute. So you're saying my cells are transmitting. I would actually, I would say it's even better than that. You can measure trees and grass and cows and dogs. I mean, everything that lives on earth 
does transmit a, a radio frequency that's measurable and uh, uh, attainable through equipment. You, you can actually detect it. This isn't, this isn't research more because I, I genuinely Which I knew. Was, I, I, I sort of was aware of it and sort of, and it was, I, I knew it was a, a, a conversation people had, but I thought it yep. was quite, quite sort of left field. I didn't realize it was. Yeah. This was made like hardcore physicists were studying this stuff uh, because, you know, in physics, we, you know, we, we like to look at how the universe is like what, what's the reality that we're presented with, not what we want. See, I, I would really, I wish I knew because it just, there are a couple of things that dropped out of uh, both the hard science, uh, you know, like physics and chemistry, uh, the radio frequency in cells is one. Uh, the other one was they used to call the the intestinal, you know, the intestinal tract, the second brain. I mean, there are almost as many nerve endings in your guts, if you will, than there are in your brain. And so to think that there's that much going on and it's not going to impact your whole body is like, why? Like, why would you think that? Yeah. You know, so now that, you know, they call it all these new discoveries with, oh, you know, your, your microbiome will affect your, yeah. your mind. It's like, yeah, we knew that in 43, 1943, Mark. It was commonly known that your, your stomach combined with your intestines had a dramatic effect on your brain chemistry, your mood, uh, even your personality. But it just got kind of brushed aside. It's really weird. Yeah. All right. We're coming to the end of the time. I'm nervous in asking this question, uh, <laughs> but I often do ask this question. Is there anything you'd like to ask me? How is your transition from corporate to entrepreneurship going? Um, good. So I've actually got four businesses, sort of three or four businesses. So I've got a coaching business where I help startups and small businesses um, I've got my property business where I invest at the moment I'm sourcing for other people. Mm -hmm. um, I've just with, with a podcast guest that I've, I've got a relationship with, we've just done a spin-off business where we're matching guests on podcasts. So you can pay oh, yeah. me and we, we, we match you up. And then I've got my podcast, which is not a business. It's, it's more of a, I say hobby, but it's, it's, it's more than a hobby, but it, 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 it I don't do it for the money. I, I do it because I love having great conversations and, um, and they're doing all right. They could do better. It's really interesting because when you ask that, because I, I, I developed probably always was, but I, I'm the entrepreneur. I'm the visionary. I want to think about the, the plan. How do we get here? We want to get here in this time. We want to do this. And my wife is fantastic in, she's, she's like my, um, my, my CFO. She's the chief financial officer in our house. Um, okay. That's great. That's fantastic. What's coming in to the budget <laughs> this month. And it's really right. grounding for me. We have, we have, difficult conversations at times but it's really grounding yeah. for me and I wouldn't change it for the world because she gives me when I go off on the sort of dreaming well I, I could have this I could employ this I could buy this whatever it is sometimes you need as a as, as sometimes it's a business partner sometimes it's a personal partner just someone just to check you like don't don't buy that other course which is going to teach you x if you haven't paid the other course yet do you know what i mean it's that sort mm -hmm. of um and uh and so it's it's a challenge it is a challenge and it's the challenge is that we've been used in my family to a regular amount every month for yeah. the last well between me and my wife we've been we've lived together for 12 no married for 12 years probably lived for like 13 14 get that one right I, 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 did, I just fact checked in my head first of all uh, and 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 being so regimented of knowing what's coming in and what needs to be spent on this on that on the mm -hmm. on the food on the things it's it's a challenge to then have a variable amount coming in every month mm -hmm. sometimes it's good if you get a property deal sometimes it's not so good if you have a quite a few months or my coaching is going well but then suddenly one or two leaves because of one reason or another we've had all mm -hmm. this in, in sort of like so I left October 
2020. So we're not even a, a, a full year through this this process. And I think for me, that's the, the toughest part is because my wife wants to know what are you reaching your salary, the amount your salary was, mm-hmm. because I can now with that be able to work out what needs to go on this, on that, on it, yep. it, Y and Z. When it's variable, it just makes that conversation a little bit harder. And what I've been quite protective of which is tricky because I've had a couple of my own properties boilers have gone and it's just thrown my my yeah, I yeah. had a contingency in my property business which was going to sort of um supplement if something else isn't working or the our boiler goes or the the windows need repairing I I had that that um that contingency available right. to me over the winter I think it was literally October, November, two of the boilers went, I had to spend four grand, no, three grand each plus mm. plus installation on those. And that then knocked me back from where I was in a relatively good position initially. So a long answer to the question is, I think for me, the hardest thing is where my wife wants to know, have you made the salary amount that you were earning being able to supplement that because she's still living i'm still paying her a salary or not paying her a salary is going into our joint account for all the different yep. items that we're doing and that is the hardest thing for me because it's almost like we need to break our thought process out of me supplying a salary for our lifestyle more like well because it's difficult because difficult, they're in different accounts so one's very specific business accounts which go to the businesses and, and and anything that needs to go in there and then it comes into our joint account which is yep. spending and 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 all different sorts of things that, that putting money away savings all this sort of jazz that we we try and try and do as much as we can so that's the hardest thing for me is that variance of money coming in and 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 going out and and the unexpected thing which you have planned for with your contingency fund but when it goes it it causes a stressor and i now worry about money i never worried about money if i earned a lot of money i've earned in my relationship with my wife i've earned not a lot of money and i've earned a decent salary Mm -hmm. and i never worried about it a because i just I don't know. It was always like, yeah, it'll work out. It's work out. I'd, we'll do it next month or something like that. Mm-hmm. I now worry about money so much more just because I've I've made a commitment to my wife at the moment that we get a salary in every month. So that that would be my sort of long answer to quite a straightforward question. But yeah, it, it it's tough. That variable amount of money coming in versus the the solidity of knowing you're getting X in every month it's been a challenge yeah i so the way i describe that is it's going from a work work money lifestyle and really certainty to a work work maybe nothing <laughs> lifestyle mm-hmm. uh these this used to come up quite a bit when i was coaching traders you know so currency you know, shares and, and commodities and things like that yeah. um which of course is is why a lot a lot of that business revolved around psychology and you know how people think and the way we react to stress. Uh, so yeah, it, that's a that's part I think of entrepreneurship, especially if you're you know transitioning from a a, a a long long-ish career where you do have the salary coming in, right? Because that the certainty is tied to the the overall business. And it's like, well, Hey, as long as the people, you know, up there do their jobs, then the checks are going to keep coming down here. Well, it's like, now you're up there. Yeah. Right? So somebody else is thinking the same, you know, now the, the relationship is reversed. That's interesting. But it's interesting. The responsibility, the, the knowing that it's me that has to do this. I can't, as I say, rely on mm-hmm. someone else to do something for it. I, I, I have no problem with that. I, I, I almost relish the opportunity to be able to to just in a way go fuck it i'm going to do this because i'm going to spend 6 months doing this because i think this is going to make so for example in the uk i saw 
that the next thing from a property point of view was what they call service or it's like hotels and um and sort of uh living where you you go to a villa or whatever in the UK mm-hmm. and stuff and I saw when COVID was sort of kicking off, I was like, well, if if we can't travel, when we when this does free up, people are gonna want to go on holiday. So we need to we need to have the right sort of villas mm. and, and houses and, and stuff. And people will, yeah, sure. will want to go away, but they can't go abroad. And and I told a couple of people this, and, and some of the people made decisions which I chose not to for different reasons, but um I think that's like that I gave to people because it's just like, well, it's, it's common sense. You you will be able to work it out. But um, if you haven't seen it, this is what I think is going to happen. Now, mm-hmm. uh, now I try not to predict because I think anyone who thinks they know the answer, uh, every, every advice I give comes with a huge caveat. I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm, not I'm not a financial officer. I'm not a HR specialist. I'm not a whatever, whatever. But I do think that, um, that that responsibility and not having the guy next to me if if i'm ill which doesn't touch wood doesn't really happen that much but i bet i get a cold next week but you know what i mean like (laughs) i don't get ill particularly so but if i was ill at work someone just did my job for me or someone goes on maternity leave and someone covers their job and sometimes it's an opportunity sometimes it's a curse whatever in where i am now if i don't perform well, that's it. <laughs> right. That's it. You 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 get nothing in. And and I'm getting to the point where the business is the businesses are starting to pick up and we're starting to get good momentum on a couple of them. And so things are are, are definitely working. But I just think that that whole responsibility side, it it it's almost it's fine. I know I've got to do it. I'll do it. Now, if I have to take a job for six months or whatever that might happen in the next sort of year to 18 months, two years, whatever, I don't know. I don't know. Might do, might not happen. But the whole, the whole ethos of being an entrepreneur was not something I naturally affiliated with. It was something that I learned and then Mm. doing certain things like my properties and my podcasting, which gave me that insight of doing things purely on my own and, and, you get the results for what, what how well you do uh, just full stop yeah that doesn't that doesn't bother me that's fine i can deal with that sort of pressure and that sort of responsibility um it's an interesting one because i think like the whole sort of nature nurture of entrepreneurs i am a mm. I, i'm 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 a, I, i've developed as a person into an entrepreneur i didn't start at 21 well uh, this, it's a bit uh, we need to stop so i need to i need to finish this but just on this last point and i'd be interested to hear your thoughts as well uh before we finish um i had uh i went for a couple of jobs and took a couple of jobs when i was uh about like 18 19 20 which were sales and while i was mm. learning to be i ended up not taking it up as a as a full-time job but learning the skills of being a salesman Mm-hmm. Um, I developed skills that when I started working with someone who was naturally a salesperson and he helped me through my career and define my career differently than everyone else in the corporate world, it was based around sales. It was, it was selling myself. I yep. wasn't, I was selling products, but it's part of selling yourself to your peers, to your bosses or whatever. And I just want to know before we finish, how because the other thing i hear a lot is people who become hugely sex successful often start in sales because it gives them resilience it gives them techniques it gives them skills that that people that never go into that area never really develop what's your thoughts on sales did you ever do sales and or did you or, or, or what's your thoughts on sort of sales equaling success yeah so i'll start with uh, something that you, that you just said I think the people that we say are, you know, the quote unquote natural salespeople are the ones who started much earlier than they think, right? So sales, it is about communication, right? So meaning you've got to be able to explain something in a way that people understand. And, you know, you, so you're not talking too fast. You're not talking too slow. Like there's, there's all that. 
it's also reading people. Um, so I've observed that some of the best salespeople come from the most troubled households. And I, I believe it's because they, they've got to get good at, at reading someone. So when somebody, you know, when a parent, whoever the abuser is, comes into the room, you've got to know, like with some certainty, how the next few moments are going to go. Wow. Is this going to be bad? Is it going to be good? Do I need to run? You know, and I'm, I'm laughing about it more out of, you know, personal pain and experience than anything else. So I think there's that aspect to it. But I think what, what drives that person into sales is usually um, happenstance, right? So they, they started out in a job. They wound up selling by accident. Somebody from the outside said, hey, you seem pretty good at this kid. So then they started doing it. Right. Well, then, now you've got somebody who has all the raw ingredients mm. in the right environment so that those ingredients will actually blossom into what you just said, like late, much later in life. Oh, that he's a natural salesperson. Mm. And so I, I think um, like if you, if you watch Yo-Yo Ma play, you would say, oh, that's natural talent. Mm. Uh, you probably disagree. You might say, well, no, I kind of practice all the bloody time. Yeah. Yeah. So there, I think there's some of that. Now, at the natural part, though, is the way that person was able to take that traumatic experience, needing to read someone like with some skin in the game, and then, you know, not go into a shell and, and go in a different direction. That's what I think is the natural part of it. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the, the background, right? So it's like, well, hey, Maceo, if I grew up in a household that wasn't like that, you know, then, then what? Well, then it's like you just said it, their skills. You know, selling is not this foreign thing. It's not about DNA or, you know, a mutant superpower, you know, like Wolverine or something like that. It really is understanding that, um, you know, you need to have a, a sequence of information uh, so that somebody can make a decision. You've got to bring in emotion and, yeah. and all of that. And there are little nuances, uh, you know, so if somebody doesn't seem like they've got a good framework for making a decision, you can give them a decision tree. Like, and so the, the easiest one that most people know of in the States, we call it the Ben Franklin close, right? So it's okay. Wrote write all the pros on one side, all the cons on the other. And if the pros outweigh the cons, then go ahead and give me your money. Well, so as a salesperson, you have to ask, well, why would I do that? Well, you would do that if, if the person you're talking to doesn't seem like they have a mechanism to make decisions, right. which I could say is really about 90% of people. Most people don't really have a, a, a method for, for making decisions, and which is why those types of closes work their way into sales, but not a lot of people talk about the real reason why that they're there. And so it really is to help the person that you're selling to, you know, make a better decision than one at random. Um, so the, I, I would say though, that the better you are at the skills of sales, the better you're going to be overall. And I think what holds people back is they make this, uh, they, they equate sales with manipulation in a bad way. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by in a bad way? Well, when was the last time you saw a woman leave the house without any makeup on? Mm -hmm. I would say, well, yeah, in most Western countries, it's like almost never, unless you're Amish or you know something like that, where you have a religious objection to it. Well, I would say, well, isn't that a form of, deception like that's not really her face she just put a bunch of goop on top of it what about her clothing right so there's push-up bras there's spanks i mean i've seen ads on on youtube now where women who are obviously overweight can look like they're not overweight mm -hmm. that's a major deception right so if i'm a guy that that isn't attracted to a woman that's say 40 or 50 pounds overweight we're out things are going well every time i see her she's wearing you know that pull-up thing and like, wait, I'm going to be, wait a minute, what happened? And I'm, and I'm not making any judgments here. I'm just saying like, we're, we deal with these types of manipulations all the time, yeah. but we, for what, for some reason we've decided that when it's in, when it has to do with sales, it's bad, but when it has to do with like who your life partner is, it's okay. I'm just calling out the, the absurdity of that, of that ratio there. So cut yourself some slack. It, you, you can be around people for a very limited amount of time and realize that there's a certain amount of manipulation in everything. If you've got kids, you know, you've got to manipulate a situation to get a result. I don't want to go to bed. What are you going to do? 
you know, you're going to say, hey, you know, here, have some juice and it's really like Benadryl or NyQuil <laughs> or something. No, you're going to manipulate the situation and the child so that they go to bed. So I'm just, uh, again, I'm, I'm illustrating some absurd points to, to bring out how often we do manipulate and then how we, we kind of justify it. So in sales, you know, we do have to be careful. And when you get really good at sales and persuasion, you know, you can do some harm with that. You know, you only have to look at companies like Theranos or Enron, you know, these Bernie Madoff, like these major scams to realize, well, yeah, you can do some bad stuff with that. So oh, we've got all these extreme examples. What, what I would say is you'll find, you'll find that sales ability gives you the skills to read a situation for what it is and be able to act in that situation to achieve an outcome. And so I, what I would advocate for is that we should do more of that, but layer on top of that, the good of the people that we're with, you know, the so-called golden rule. You know, would I want somebody to manipulate me? Well, yeah. I mean, if I'm like in a really bad mood, I would love it if someone would manipulate me to be in a good mood. If I'm not getting the results I'm getting in, that I want in my business, I absolutely want someone to manipulate me so that I get the results that I want. Yeah. It's with that mindset, right, where we really are setting out to do the best that we can in service of other people. That is, you know, what I would call the, the ultimate expression of sales. And so the skills that, that you, you can develop in the sales arena will serve you, whether it's a corporate environment, an entrepreneurial environment, whether you're, you know, serving on a nonprofit board, you've got kids. I mean, these are core critical skills uh, just to get along, you know, even in society. I mean, just like with, uh, you know, little Mikey at the daycare. That I, I sold him, right? I mean, granted, I didn't have to sell very hard because the, the dude was hungry. But, but if I would have said, hey, do you want a fish? He probably would have said no, right? Oh, you know, do you want some raw hamburger? Probably not. But apple juice or applesauce, absolutely. So you know, I actually went through an inventory of what was in my daughter's bag. So she's got apple juice. Uh, she's got some dried cranberries. She's got pistachios. And then she's got these little fig bars. Well, kids, you know, if, if they, their palate's not developed, they don't really like bitter, right? So I was like, okay, the cranberries are out, that fig bar, you know, it's got that kind of sour sweet thing going on. Uh, you know, so that leaves either pistachios or the applesauce. I'm thinking, well, I doubt his parents give him pistachios. So if I say the word, he probably doesn't even know what it means. Ding, 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 applesauce. So that, that was me as a salesman looking at a situation, seeing that I could make a difference and then doing my best to give a positive outcome. And so in sales, it would have been, you know, hey, Mikey, do you want some applesauce? Oh, yeah, well, that'll be $5, right? That's, that's sales. Now, the reason why I chose that example, I think most people would agree in that environment, right? Let's say Mikey actually had five, $5 in his little four-year-old pocket. Most people would say, eh, I'm a sale. I don't know. That just doesn't feel right to me. And that's where people have a problem with sales. And I would say, well, great. Then don't charge the dude five bucks. Mm -hmm. you know, so what most people are reporting on are all the times where they had buyer's remorse or you know, they felt like they were taken advantage of. I would say, then you learn to be a salesperson and you go do different, be the change, right? So get the sales skills so that you cannot do that out there in the world. And then you can train other people to do that and not do that out there in the world. And then there's going to be more of us than the, the schmucks that, you know, want to go out and charge poor Mikey five bucks for the applesauce. So he could scream in and take care. <laughs> right. We're going to have to bring it to a close. I, I would yep. say, um, my conclusion for you is your brain is your superpower. Right. I, uh, yes, absolutely. I, the fact that you thought through those five different options so fast to get to Apple Source, I think is is absolutely your superpower. I think probably my superpower is self-reflection. I can do it pretty quickly now. I can I can review a situation or a, a, an experience and and so so I think our brains both work in strange ways let's say yes um, but i think i think most people don't ever embrace that superpower 
They get right. worried about it or get concerned about it, and all things can fall from that, which is a completely different podcast. But, <laughs> Indeed. I have to bring it to an end. Thank you so much again. We've overran hugely, but I don't care. I've had this fantastic conversation with oh, you. Oh, great. Thanks, Thank Mark. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Again soon. Cheers.